Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, having me here today with this terrific panel. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Adele Morris. I'm a senior advisor at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors here in DC. I'm in the Division of Financial Stability, and my work involves incorporating climate considerations into the Fed's financial stability framework. So um, we're, we're working hard to think through how, how climate can feature in the mandates of financial regulators in the United States. Um, I'm joined by two terrific panelists. Um, the, our first speaker is Lars Peter Hansen, who's the David Rockefeller Distinguished Service Professor and the Director of the Becker Friedman's Macro Finance Research Program at the University of Chicago, and Peter Wilcoxon, who's a professor at the Syracuse University's Maxwell School, and he's a professor in the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs. He's um, also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and that's how I know Pete from many years of collaborating on our research at Brookings together. Um, so I want to kind of sort of, first of all, thank you, Jim Stock, for the wonderful um, description of how economic models feature in various parts of climate making endeavors or climate policy making endeavors. Um, oh, wait, I got to give the disclaimer. I'm still getting used to this. So like I said, I'm at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Everything I'm going to say is my opinion not to be construed as the views of the Federal Reserve or its governors. And that's like the same disclaimer, every Fed person ever uh, in, in a setting like this. So just so you know, these are my, my viewpoints. Um, so, so I wanna thank Jim for the terrific uh, description on, on the applications of economic models in the climate policy making context. And that was a terrific presentation. I'm gonna kind of give you the research edition version of that. Like how are academic researchers using economic models in this space? And there is a tremendous amount of overlap because you know economists and others go into climate and energy economics in part because of the compelling policy questions. So there are uh, many overlaps in the applications of economic models. And, and the same principles apply. You're using a model to ask a question and explore potential outcomes. And these are all you know, projections of the future, forward-looking analyses, which is really important as we know in the climate realm where past is not necessarily prologue. And what I wanna do is kind of relate um, what you're gonna hear from Lars and Pete about their work into that kind of nice chart that, that Jim gave us but sort of the research edition of it. So at a very high level, um, we can use economic models to explore really basic fundamental questions about how society allocates resources. So one of the things you're gonna hear from Lars is, to, is it in the category that I would describe as how should society allocate resources across the different parts of the climate challenge? So you, there's so many parts. There's the market failures of the greenhouse gas emissions that are unpriced and the public goods associated with fundamental technological research and development, for example, in low greenhouse gas technologies. You've got issues around adaptation and reducing the damages from climatic disruption, maybe raising roads, for example. And then you've got questions that relate to other parts of social science, including diplomacy and how to manage the distributional outcomes of climatic disruption and climate related policies, both domestically and internationally. How do you leverage US action into action internationally? So what Mars, Lars is gonna talk about is using those models um, at the very highest levels to think through how various dimensions of uncertainty in the climate challenge can affect the optimal mix 
of emissions abatement and research and development. So it's not, it's not like Congress necessarily does that explicitly, but implicitly society does make those trade-offs. And, and it also depends, like how do you think systematically about uncertainties? And how does your answer depend on the quality and, and magnitude of risk aversion? And how much do we care about those risks? So now let me relate these things kind of into the rest of the workshop that you've, that you've some of which you've already seen, but we'll, we'll continue today and tomorrow. Um, you've we've heard about how the, the, the question of how does climate affect the most likely projection of GDP? And there it's a forecasting application. This is a special kind of projection where we're trying to decide what's more likely than something else and what does that depend on? And it's kind of um, a, a challenge here because climate hasn't necessarily featured in that literature very much yet. And if you're interested in kind of that, that literature and, and papers adjacent to that, I do recommend that white, white paper that OMB and CEA produced and it has a really nice lit review in there. Um, session three today, the question's gonna look at the, um, the question's gonna feature, what are the potential monetized damages from a disrupted climate and acidified ocean. I put that in that category. I don't know if they're necessarily gonna look at ocean acidification, but those social costs of climatic damages are a, a, a well and currently actively being developed uh, direction in the research. Some of the policy applications are quantifying those benefits of avoided damages when we're analyzing the net economic benefits from a particular emissions abatement policy. And this work can also inform the optimal policies for adaptation. How do we allocate across the different climatic damages to optimize how much we can avoid damages uh, in the future by various investments? So there are many dimensions of that research and different kinds of models that go into it. We'll hear a little bit about that this afternoon. And of course, there's other aspects of those costs, not just their aggregate, but also how they're distributed across households by income class and other demographics, by regional disaggregation, and the, the both the spatial and the temporal dimensions of those climatic damages. And all of those are interesting to researchers and to policymakers. So in session four, perhaps the operative question would be, how might the economic and environmental outcomes of different policies um, emerge depending on what those policies and other assumptions uh, that apply? So for example, you know, the key application that we talked about uh, or that Jim talked about in his keynote are you know, the macroeconomic outcomes of potential policies. And as we know, there are many other outcomes that policymakers care about. And the researchers in this literature generally wanna be supportive of quality policy design and implementation, right? What policies are gonna be most cost-effective, most equitable? How do you strike trade-offs across those two different policy objectives? How do you design a policy so that it can address you know, something that might be a, a, a concern to particular stakeholders or some challenge to the policy design? Maybe you're concerned about trade exposed industries or you're worried about low income households and researchers like to uh, contribute policy design ideas that can support a functional policy discussion, both in Washington at the state and at the state level, but also in international agreements. So some of the outcomes that feature in those models that are used for policy and uh, analysis include obviously the macroeconomic variables, but also those distributional outcomes, sectoral outcomes, trade, labor market outcomes, and outcomes that relate to the co-benefits such as air quality and Outcomes that can reveal things like unintended consequences, where you may be thinking you're helping one industry, but you're inadvertently hurting another industry, 
or something to that effect. And in general, the way we use those models is we're comparing a simulation of a, of a future that doesn't have a policy in it with a, a simulation that does have the policy in it. So you need to have a model that can simulate the relevant policy and the uh, variables of interest. So, so the research, I mean, there's so many aspects to the research in this area. Uh, there's a big and growing literature on different kinds of policies. And it's really been um, one of the highlights of my career to participate in that literature and to be supportive of members of Congress as they design their legislation and hopefully achieve um, some of our climate objectives. Another application of this research is as an input to other kinds of analysis. And so this is where we get into some of the financial sector outcomes. So if you simulate, for example, a tr transition future where maybe there's a, 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 an ambitious climate policy and maybe you layer onto that some technology assumptions that perhaps add economic stress to the to the transition policy, you get these projected variables that then you can use in the analysis of financial outcomes that maybe inform, well, what would happen to the balance sheets of a particular financial institution? Or what might happen through the financial system if you follow those impacts from one part of the financial system to another? And that's something that's um, kind of a growing field within my space in terms of looking at climate scenario analyses. And some of the research and uh, policy projections that are capable uh, for some of these models are important inputs to that kind of work. So finally, um, uh, so, so this brings me to Pete's presentation and his work is, I think, solidly in that class of models. He's gonna talk about the G cubed model that can be used for some of these policy analyses and, analyses and also as an input potentially to some kinds of financial uh, um, scenario analyses. And finally, there's a separate class of models that we haven't talked about too much, which are very specialized and they focus on a particular sector. Maybe it's land use or transportation or just the power sector or the energy sector, maybe more broadly, but not necessarily the macro economy. And these are really important to analyze, you know, specialized policies. For example, you know, you wanna know the outcomes of a refrigerator energy efficiency standard. Well, you're not gonna use a macro model for that, but you're gonna need a specialized model and researchers contribute to that literature as well as the federal agencies that might be involved in those kinds of policy making. So um, now how, do, how are we gonna bring that back to the topic of the macro models for today? So I think what you're gonna hear from Lars and Pete is gonna, is gonna help us think through how long, how long run economic growth can, can depend on how we address the climate challenge. Like these models and their insights can be inputs to some of the, the factors that go into macro modeling. And um, from Lars, we can think through how, how we address the climate challenge can also influence long run factors, especially given the kinds of uncertainties that we face. And in addition, I think the kinds of model that Pete's gonna talk about can help us understand the range of potential transition outcomes. We know that long-run growth is gonna depend on, on our transition policies. And because those have great uncertainty, it helps us to evaluate a range of potential scenarios. And, and these are the uh, illustrative of the kind of tools that can do that. So with that, I'm gonna turn to Lars and um, you can uh, load up his slides. Thank you, Adele. Um, I have to do something to load up the slides. Oh, there they are. Good. 
Thanks. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, to, to speak and talk about re uh, research topic that I've been very fascinated with for uh, uh, for several years now, and and it's and it's carried over to a variety of contexts, including in the last few years, climate economics. Um, so just you know, I'm going to be talking across multiple papers and from, from the climate side, um, climate economic side. Uh, I have collaborators. Uh, Mike Bardet and Buzz Brock. Uh, I also there's inputs from this from decision theory and the, and and have decision theory co collaborators from multiple sources which are also listed here. Decision theory is a way to think about what prudent decision making is in complicated, uncertain environments in ways that are uh, um, uh, sensible or prudent. I'm reluctant to use the word rational because it's loaded, especially when it get very complicated environments. But anyway, it's it's uh, it's it's a, that, that those tools turn out to be very very valuable. Um, so let me quote from a person in the audience here in a, in, in a recent paper. Um, the economic consequence of many of the complex risks associated with the climate change cannot, however, currently be quantified. These unquantified, poorly understood, and awfully deeply uncertain risks can and should be included in economic evaluations and decision-making processes. So I certainly we're very sympathetic with that goal. We're, we're, uh, we're trying to address it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a certainly a hard I'm a hard goal, and, but but uh, I think there's things that can be said about it. So let me, this is something that keeps me up at night. This Hayek's, uh, a quote from Hayek's uh, Nobel address. That is, there's this pretense of knowledge if you, uh, it, that, that shows up often in policy making circles and that can be harmful. Um, and, and, and the role of, you know, this is supposed to be a committee that's, uh, that, that we're put together by the National Academy of Sciences. As, as scientists, we're supposed to be pro uh, producing credible scientific inputs into, uh, into the process. Um, and, and, and that means that we have to figure out what the credibility is of the uh, inputs we're putting into it. We could, uh, if we pretend we know everything, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, maybe that can impact policy, but it's, not to, but, but it's not true to the scientific underpinnings. So there's a real challenge here, like for quantitative policy analysis, how should we acknowledge the limits to our understanding? So I'm gonna be talking about uncertainty, but I'm gonna be talking about it in broader terms. I'm gonna use a different language than um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Jim used for reasons that will become evident subsequently. Um, uh, I'm gonna reserve risk for something very special. I mean, and I'm gonna call uncertainty more general, uncertainty more broader concepts, which I'll say more about as we go forward. It's in a policy making setup, there's some important trade offs. Economists always like to think in terms of trade offs. There's important trade offs which we uh, have, have to confront here. When we have multiple models or on the table, how do we assign? How do we assign weight to best guesses versus potentially bad outcomes? If we just go for best guesses, we miss the possibility of something bad happening. If we focus only on what's bad, then you don't get up in the morning. You just give up. So you, you know, th 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 there's this trade-off about how you kind of uh, agree about both of these things, and that's very important. The other one is one that's been uh, studied a little bit less formally within this uh, climate economics literature, and that although it's discussed all the time, do we act now or do we wait until we learn more? So. One concern when we start talking about uncertainty is this, it's just going to lead to inaction. But there's nothing about decision theory under, under uncertainty that tells you that you should, you should opt not act. Possibilities of bad outcomes are enough to make you want to act now. You don't have to be 100% sure of them. And so there's an interesting trade-off, though. Do we act now or do we wait until we learn more? And some of the calculations I'm going to be talking about are, are, are meant to get at this in a stylized way. Okay, so what's the challenge here? So... <laughs> In a, in a very uh, general setting, um, there's limits to our understanding about the potential impact of climate change. And, and I'll be talking about three different sources today in some, in some illustrative computations. One is from the geoscientific part of it. CO2 emissions today impact future outcomes. There's the economic component. Climate change in the future alters opportunities in social well-being. And the third piece of this is research and development invested today may eventually lead to economically viable, clean technologies. Now, all of these are uncertain. And so one of the questions we want to face is, you know, which ones really matter for designing different policy questions? Uh, I, I, um, that, and, and, and part of what we want are ways to think about that, that challenge. And, 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 and in fact, if we can isolate the ones that are most important, maybe there's ways we can actually close the knowledge gaps in, you know, along those dimensions. Um, now, 
the literature, this uncertainty literature I've been talking about is really aims for a very broad perspective on uncertainty. Um, and I find it useful to put it into three categories, right? I'm going to use the term risk for something special. It's kind of what we teach in our microeconomics classes typically. It's unknown out, it's what's in rational expectations models and in terms of what we give economic agents. Risk is unknown outcomes, but known probabilities. Coin flips, roll of the dice, and the, and the like. Uh, um, and so like when we build dynamic models, we put shocks in those models with distributions. That, 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 that's going to be a source of risk inside those models. Uh, now I'm going to use the term ambiguity to mean um, I've got multiple models on the ta table. Um, I, I always like to think, you know, beware the person of one model. I think especially when there's situations of uncertainty, we want to look across models. How much weight do we assign to each of these? There's a, for, from a standpoint of statistician, there's a form of prior uncertainty. Uh, um, we can't resolve this just from historical evidence typically, and it requires subjective inputs. How do we confront prior uncertainty? There's a there's a you know a wonderful contribution back in the 50s by uh, by um, yeah you know by Jimmy Savage when he was at the University of Chicago that produces an axiomatic system that just makes the um, subjective probabilities are, are part of the decision making process. But even Savage in his own writing acknowledged the fact that these subjective inputs we may only know with uh, very crude amounts of uncertainty. Now in in, in a lot of econometric uh, uh, situations where we teach, we imagine sample size and data just uh, swamps priors, and we don't have to think about this. But in the climate or region arena, I think that is just not, not the correct perspective. The third one is potential misspecification, unknown ways in which the model might give flawed probabilistic predictions. So in this in, in this context, does, for, from a statistical language, there's kind of likelihood uncertainty. I'm going to write down this model. I'm going to write down this parameterized family of likelihoods, or uh, or or some such short sort. Um, we use models as simple. Um, we know they're simplifications. We know that they're yet yeah, go along some dimensions necessarily wrong. Uh, the simplifications make them transparent and understandable. But then, how do we use them in sensible ways? And the three components of uncertainty, I often think of this one as the one that is um, um, you know, hardest to wrestle with. But 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 perhaps in many respects, the most important one. Now, this is, decision theory is going to include for, you know, you know, formulations that are explicitly dynamic, recursive, can be implemented with dynamic programming type methods, because if the methods that come out aren't tractable, they're just not going to be very valuable to us. And the way I think about this is it suggests better ways for doing uncertainty quantification for dynamic economic models used for private sector planning and government policy assessment. Now, we can go through and characterize the uncertainties and, 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 and their magnitudes, but at the end of the day, not all certainties are going to matter. And, and so what you want is a framework that allows you to figure out which uncertainties are really critical to the question at hand and which ones don't matter very much. Yeah. So basically what we're aiming for is these uh, tractable methods and we want to isolate the impact of uncertainty on climate policy and outcomes, assess, the, assess it, and then isolate the form that really matter matters. Right. So roughly speaking, yeah, I. I um, I would love to give you uh, uh, and, uh, all the mathematics behind this, but I think I, in 20 minutes, that'd be a bit extreme. Um, it, it, it's, it's a way to navigate this uncertainty. We want to allow these models, there's ambiguity, there's going to be in, in practice misspecified. Um, we want to use them in sensible ways. And so um, what we're going to set up for ourselves is basically a very extensive sensitivity analysis, sensitivity over quote, quote, uh, so these ambiguity or these prior sensitivity over likelihoods and the like, we still want to use the tools of probability and statistics to limit the type of and, and amounts of uncertainty. But we also put the following question on the table, which is not use, usually talked about on policy settings, but anytime you open the door on uncertainty, it's, it kind of has to be there, aversion. How much do you dislike the uncertainty about probabilities over, over, over future events? You can't really address a, a prudent policy problem without without uh, um, uh, putting this on the table. And we as scientific um, researchers, the thing that we can do is trace through the impacts of these different aversions to, uh, uh, yeah, to policy outcomes. It's not our job to tell society exactly how averse they should be. We can, it's our job to explain what the consequences are of those aversions. Then finally, the implementation is you got to target these uh, components which are most adverse. That comes out of the whole kind of computational solutions of the models. And um, 
and, and, and part of an outcome of this is a, is, is a robust adjusted or uncertainty adjusted probability measures. Basically, we have uncertainty about the probabilities. We're going to produce these uncertainty adjusted probability measures that are going to be most per that, that are pertinent for valuation along with the design of robust decision rules. So along with working out um, these decision rules, where we're going to back out these probabilities, these uncertainty adjusted probabilities are the, are the ones that are pertinent for valuation. So, so they help us think about uncertainty quantification to address two questions. How much uncertainty aversion should we impose? There we can do trace of this, uh, uh, this sensitivity I talked about and which one matters the most. Uh, so <clears throat> social valuation, there's, um, in the, there's too often discussions of in, in kind of cost benefit analysis, looking at local valuation, have these discussions, what should the, uh, what should the discount rate be? If you're in a stochastic environment, you need to do stochastic discounting in order to do these margin valuations. And the same is true if you want to even compute optimal Peruvian taxes. Asset pricing theory for a long time has insights on how to address this, although it's, it, although it, although it's designed for a different problem. It was a design for uh, market valuation, you know, the valuation of assets like financial, physical, human, and organizational environmental capital. But with each of these assets is a prospective sequence of net payoffs or investments. You can apply these same tools to social instead of market valuations, because we think about the you know, if we're going to emit carbon in the atmosphere today, there's going to be this social adverse cash flow that comes out. If we invest in new green technologies today, there's going to be uncertain payoffs of that in the future. So, so we can use these same type of constructs, but to think about social valuation instead of market valuation and extend them to, um, uh, to say to include these uncertainty components, which I talked about, and that's the aim. Um, so we want to do social valuation under this, this, these types of aversions. Yes, you want to do discounted expected values of social cash flows, as is typical, but the expectations are constructed from these kind of minimizing probabilities, which we compute as part of the solution. Again, we want to do stochastic discounting, but under a probability measure inferred uh, as part of the solution. So I'm going to give you some Ill, uh, 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 an Ill, a very illustrative economy with some calculations. Um, this is going to be a highly stylized aggregate economy. I've been doing other research, which I would love to talk about too, but time doesn't permit. On, on the Brazilian Amazon, this is a, that, that's a, a spatial dynamic models, in which we have data on up to uh, up to a thousand different uh, locations in, in in the Amazon, and and, and, you know, and productivity data on agriculture and carbon absorption and the like. But uh, I'm going to give you uh, this more aggregate example today. Um, so there's you know many calls for immediate climate policy implementation. There's a limits to our understanding of the timing and magnitude. How do we confront this? So we're going to imagine this policymaker in a situation in which, at the future, we're going to know more about the damage severity. Um, we're uncertain about it now, uh, um, substantially so. As we start damaging substantially the environment. Which is things that are going to get, get revealed to us, or, 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 um, but at that point in time, it may be very costly to act. So this is when we trade off between acting now versus waiting. We're going to put, we're going to inter have research and development, and this can hasten the uh, uncertain discovery of green technologies, and, and, you know, as, um, as part of a part of the policy toolkit. And then finally, we have this risk component, and this is typical in, uh, in, in, in so-called stochastic equilibrium models that, that typically focus on risk. And we're going to have both kind of so-called Brownian motion or kind of local Gaussian or, or local, locally normally distributed shocks, as well as Poisson-type jump risk or, or much more dramatic sh shocks that can also occur. Okay. So, um, so I, I will just give you a quick schematic of the model. It's kind of a fairly standard model with, uh, with, uh, with climate change put on top of it. We're going to have capital. It's going to produce output. Uh, output then for the, can be divided into investment or consumption. Emissions then uh, uh, alter the output that, yeah, um, that comes in. Uh, without climate change, the more you emit, then you, it has to do with more energy input into production, and that's going to increase the output. So now we add climate. And emissions also do damage to the uh, also impact the climate, and that damages the economic well-being. So this is the externality. So economies, if I took just took the uh, model on the right-hand side, quote, I could imagine the invisible hand works just fine, and there's and I say no intervention is necessary. Now I've got the externality, and now this is where the market failure shows up. Finally, we want to add in 
um, oops, the possibility of this kind of R&D investment, some of the outputs used for R&D investment, and down the road that could generate new economically viable clean technologies, which of which would then improve economic well-being. So we've got these different multiple channels that we're uncertain about, and we want to uh, kind of put them all on the table at once. So there's going to be emissions impact on climate, climate impact on damages, returns to uh, investment in new green technologies as three sources. Um, so what I'm going to show you is uh, we're, um, we're hungry for better inputs and we're hungry for richer inputs. We just have to do this in a tractable way. What, what, what I'm putting here is in the red histogram is um, we baseline kind of climate sensitivities. Uh, basically, the if you, if you look at pulse experiments from uh, climate models, you roughly speaking, you, you get a peak impact from emissions after about 10 years and then things start flattening out. This is kind of where things flatten out, looking across models. And so this, this, this looks over about 144 different models uh, in terms of that mapping. And, the, and, then, and then the red histogram just gives you some initial statement about, about that dispersion across models. Now I could call that histogram priors if I assume all models are equally likely or um, equally plausible. You may not want to be convinced that that's that that's a relevant subjective prior to put into this, and you want to may allow for tilting. Or, okay, and so, and so once you have ambiguity over that weighting, there's going to be this notion of shifting uh, you know, the distribution. And since we're looking for a theory of caution, you, 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 you're going to shift things to the right. So that's going to take this blue, the, the red histogram, and make it the blue one. It, it loads things up a little bit more to the right. And, and, I, and I've got, got a case where less aversion and more aversion, the more aversion I have, the more I'm going to shift that distribution. So, so that minimizing distribution used for valuation is given by, um, is given by the blue histogram. And that's a cautious adjustment because we really don't know how to weight these 144 different models. Next one, I'm going to put a stylized model of damages. Um, I'm going to put a temperature anomaly at 0.5. Um, as in carbon budging, we're not going to fall off a cliff here. Instead, their damages are going to be re realized. Now, I'm showing you the whole trajectory of possible damages from the upper bound, which is the more typical Nordhaus numbers, to more extreme ones that are more like Weizmann style numbers. But we're going to be unsure about that curvature. Once we cross this threshold, though, there's going to be some Poisson event that gets triggered. Then, uh, uh, then we're going to know about that curvature once we start damaging the, the environment much more. So, so uh, this is the counterpart to a kind of combination tipping point between the kind of climate and economic systems. It's a fairly, completely highly stylized you know, the description of the uncertainty where, again, we're happy to put in richer type specifications. But now we don't know whether that anomaly is going to be at 1.5 or it could be a two. It could start at two. So there's uncertain and certainty about where that takes place. And we've got this kind of so-called Poisson intensity that increases with temperature that, uh, that that's meant to capture that uncertainty. So, so, um, so this, so there is a big event in this model, this realization of this uh, damages, and this, and the other big event is going to be the realization of a new green technology based on um, R and D investment in part. So, we don't know what the original, uh, how much damage curvature there is. It could be good news. It could be bad news. Once we get, to, you know, once we cross this threshold, um, the red line. Uh, is the case where we're treating all these different, we've got, a, you know, like 20 different curvature curves, we're treating them all equally likely. And then the blue one is once we start thinking about, well, I'm not so sure about that, uh, you know, about that weighting. Under less aversion, you see the modest adjustment. Uh, under more aversion, that, that, um, then that becomes more extreme. There's a, you know, there's a bigger push to the right, and, um, as to be expected. And then we you know, also have calculations I don't have time to show you about what happens once that gets realized. Then it could be good news, and then and 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 so uh, versus bad news. So there's kind of heterogeneous responses once the information is realized. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a few of the outcomes here. We've got two assets, social assets here. One is the social value of the stock of R&D. So we're uh, investing in R&D every, um, um, every period or instant in this in, the, in this particular model. There's going to be uh, so so the uh, there's going to be a stock of R&D, and that implicitly becomes valued. So this shows you the adjustments that so this is in a log scale, the adjustments um, uh, for, of, for, the, for the social value of R&D. Neutrality says that I'm gonna basically return to the baseline. I'm just gonna ignore, I'm just gonna um, I'm go with the baseline probabilities. And then if I have less, less aversion, I'm gonna move it up some and, and, and then more aversion, uh, even more. 
So remember, this is a log scale. So we're thinking about kind of proportional adjustments here. But these look quite modest. But I'm gonna, but but, but I'm gonna get back to that in a moment. Now I can put in these three sources of uncertainty: climate, damage, and technology. For the, uh, 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 for this calculation, under the modest aversion, really what matters here is the um, what matters the most is clearly the technology aversion. Uh, uh, the other two are much less consequential. Now, these should be stochastic simulations. We have to figure out the right way to do them, uh, report them. I mean, we, I mean, we know how to compute them, uh, but to, 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 yet, uh, but here I'm running it under a baseline that two things happen. There's no, uh, to, to, we close down the shocks along this computed trajectory, not in the solution. And, and, the, and this is also conditioned on the, uh, on the technology event, the new technology event not being realized. Um, which is also there's some probability that happens as well. So we you know, we have probabilistic adjustments for all that. Now these adjustments says what's the big deal? You know this seems like it's nothing. Well, it turns out that even these seemingly small amounts of changes in the social value of R and D have a big impact on the uh, uh, on the robust R uh, um, and D policy. So now we're uh, as a, as as a percent of GDP. If you compare the green line under neutrality to to um, up to this blue line, you see a substantial increase in the amount of R and D you're doing, based on the uncertainty inputs. Yeah, you know, I'm going into it. And again, what's driving all this is the um, is the is is is, is the technology uncertainty. Of course, that's special to the to the inputs we give into it. But this helps us think about yeah you know, which one really matters for this calculation. Um, we can also look at the kind of social cost of global warming. Um, again, these are a log scale. Uh, at this, uh, these adjustments, you know, again, look somewhat modest in terms of the valuation. Uh, but, but again, the thing that matters here is the technology aversion. So, so the big deal so far is in the R&D investments and, that it, and they're very sensitive to the uncertainty. Finally, carbon emissions. Um, so here are the implied carbon emissions. Uh, and, and you know um, trajectories, and again, these are conditioned on their do not realizing the uh, new green technology, which which of course would you know drop down to zero. Um, and again, I'm just kind of it's the um, so the I'm um, so under more aversion. Then you're going to emit your you're going to emit less carbon into the atmosphere, okay? and kind of technology aversion is kind of the big deal on these particular calculations. So, so basically putting technological considerations on the table are very important to these calculations and the uncertainty inputs into those also matter in a big way. But, um, so um, uh, let me just close by saying, uncertainty matters for policy tools like the social cost of global warming, the social investment in green technology and uh, um, research and development. Understanding the sources broadly conceived by used by the private sector and governments will make economic policy all the more effective in our views. Um, there's a variety of other things I'm happy to talk about, but time's up about computational challenges, how we can push this, this, the, the, uh, this simple model into ones with much more heterogeneity across, um, across space, which we've kind of done in our, in our Amazon process, uh, the project we like, but I'll be, uh, we'll reserve those conversations for some other time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. Um, we're going to go straight to Pete. So write down your questions for Lars, and we'll start the Q&A um, after we've looked under the hood of the G-cubed model. Okay, thanks very much, Adele. And uh, thank you everyone for being here and for uh, the privilege of letting me fill you in on some uh, work that I really enjoy talking a lot about. We're talking about a lot, okay, it's afternoon. Uh, okay, so uh, my topic is gonna be talking about uh, multi-sector climate energy models. Uh, these are generally uh, from the class of computational general equilibrium models. I'm gonna use examples from my own work, uh, including the G-Cube model uh, on which Adele and Warwick McKibben are close collaborators. And also my work with Dale Jorgensen, Mun Sing Ho and Dick Gettle on the iGEM model, which is a model of the United States. Uh, but having said that, many of the things that I'm gonna point out today are true of the broader class of models. This is just to make things a little bit more concrete. I'm also gonna draw uh, somewhat on a study uh, that the Science Advisory Board conducted for the EPA on economy-wide modeling for air regulations. 
uh, that was a, a very detailed um, uh, uh, scientific review of the landscape of computational general equilibrium models. And it has a lot of uh, helpful uh, insights for today's task as well. Okay, so the general plan is that I'm gonna talk a little bit about the structure of the models uh, so that people who are not familiar with them will know how they work. Uh, I wanna highly recommend the white paper that has come up several times in the conversation today. It is excellent, very well written. And this will just fill you in a little bit on the details of how the CGE models that are discussed there work. I'll show you uh, some illustrative results. And then I will uh, do my own version of uh, Lars's uh, What Keeps Him Awake at Night speech and talk a little bit about the parameter uncertainty and how when we think about these models, we have to be modest about exactly how precise they are. And then finally, I'll conclude uh, with some uh, thoughts on challenges and research needs. Uh, so the way these models are put together, uh, the hallmark of them is that they divide the economy uh, up into lots and lots of individual sectors or agents. Uh, G cubed, which is uh, the model that's shown up here, is an international model. So it breaks the world up into a bunch of regions. Uh, and then each region is broken up into a bunch of actors, uh, producers, household sectors, the government. And then each of the uh, produce, producing sides of the economy are broken up into subsectors. G cubed has about 20. The ones that are highlighted are connected to the energy uh, side of the economy. When you look at the broader landscape of CGE models, uh, they all uh, put their emphasis and their detail in different places. So uh, there are some models, uh, and SAGE, which is an EPA model, uh, is an example of this, which have much more detail on geography within the United States, but aren't international models. Uh, there are other models which have much more detail on the energy sector, but less detail on parts outside the energy sector. So it's a big landscape, uh, but, um, and, and I think it, uh, the thing that the uh, Science Advisory Board report for EPA uh, landed on that I'm gonna repeat here is there, uh, is no single model for all purposes. Uh, different models uh, have advantages for different uses. All right, when we think about what goes on inside one of these models, uh, this, oh, so, uh, so for people who are online, I'm sorry I'm gonna do this to you, but I'm going to use a laser pointer briefly in this to point some stuff out to people in the room. So on the left side uh, of the um, diagram here, uh, is a list of markets. So the models divide the predicting, producing side of the economy up into a bunch of individual uh, uh, individual markets, uh, each represented by a row in the table. Uh, the top part of the table are the markets for which there are private sector producers, and there are 20 sectors in G-cubed, so there are 20 rows, one for each product. The things at the bottom, for people who don't do this all the time, are primary factors, labor and capital. Those are not produced by uh, individual firms. Instead, they're supplied by households. Uh, then there's one column for each agent in the economy, somebody who buys things, so there are 20 industries in G cubed, they all buy things, intermediate goods. And then there are final demand sectors, consumption for the households, the investment sector, government spending, exports, and then imports. Um, the key characteristic of all of these CGE models is that there are, uh, the agents interact in all these markets. Uh, there, um, and the models uh, task is to find a set of prices that cause supply and demand to, eat, to balance in each of the markets. Okay, uh, getting down into more detail, each of the agents in turn is represented by a mathematical model of its behavior. So that at the top part, the, the sort of overarching piece of the model is the definition for what objective the agent is trying to uh, satisfy. So it could be minimizing cost, it could be maximizing utility, depending on whether you're looking at a household or a producing sector. And then the uh, agent buys a lot of inputs uh, and the capital labor uh, and also individual products, electricity, natural gas, transportation, durables. Um, and the hallmarks of these models are 
uh, that there are, they represent how agents are willing to substitute one input for another. So those three green circles in there represent substitution elasticities, which are estimated from historical data and try to capture how each of these agents is willing to trade off goods in the bundle, uh, one against the other. So we're trying to pick up how they react, uh, particularly to price changes. Um, the parameters, the green parameters are estimated from historical data. And then also from historical data, we get inputs or we get information on what people's patterns of purchases actually are, right? So what fraction of people's budget do they spend on energy? How much do they spend on agricultural products, durables, and so on? Now, these models are also where climate comes into the picture. So, so these models that I'm talking about here have been used for studying uh, lots of different kinds of environmental and climate policies. And when we uh, want to introduce climate into them, uh, one of the ways that it's done is by introducing reductions in productivity in uh, the industry. So if we think that agriculture will be uh, harmed by uh, lower um, rainfall, uh, we can reduce the productivity of the agricultural sector by uh, changing parameters within this model. Um, we can also, we've also, these models have also been used for looking at other kinds of environmental uh, impacts, so looking at changes in conventional air pollution, which changes mortality rates, which changes population and effective labor force. Uh, we can also look at how morbidity changes labor force uh, availability as well. Um, uh, and then finally, there's less uh, work that uh, has been done on this, but some of these models have also had environmental amenities introduced into the utility function for the agent, so that improving uh, the economy or improving the environment is actually valued uh, by the individual agents and increases uh, their benefits. Um, okay, a critically important thing for thinking about climate is the behavioral links between periods. So, uh, so the model, so, so many but not all CGE models that are used for studying climate policy have forward-looking agents forward-looking firms that think about how their investment decisions are going to affect their future cash flows, forward-looking households who think about how their uh, consumption and savings decisions today are going to affect their uh, future um, uh, their future utility, their future ability to consume. For uh, climate modeling, this is extremely important. Uh, these, these particular decisions, investment and saving, are prima facie intertemporal decisions. Uh, so it's important to have that baked into the model, but also because a lot of what we're interested in here is thinking about how agents react to anticipated changes in climate conditions or anticipated policy changes. Uh, and then finally, we're also going to be interested over the course of thinking about macroeconomics and climate in thinking about how agents respond to policy risks. So this is something that is involved in uh, what Lars was talking about, but I don't think he mentioned it explicitly. But when you think about putting incentives in place like the IRA, an important thing to keep in mind is whether agents believe you're gonna stick around and actually continue to provide the incentives that the legislation, that the legislation puts forward. Because if they don't, if it's something like a production tax credit and people don't believe it's gonna be there, they're not gonna invest because they're looking forward and they think the policy may not last. Okay, in these models, I want to circle back to the main topic of the workshop today and talk about macroeconomics. Um, what drives GDP growth? So a lot of models uh, that are used, uh, Adele mentioned, that are used for studying, for example, the energy sector, take GDP growth to be exogenous. It's just put in it by assumption. Uh, uh, CGE models build GDP up from components either on the income side by adding up what uh, the returns are to labor and capital or on the expenditure side by adding up what the value is of what people spend on final demand. So we build these up from the individual behavior, the components of uh, the model. And the things that typically drive GDP growth are things that we've talked about a lot today, but just to emphasize how they interact into the, with the model is labor force growth is very important. Uh, that's usually exogenous. Um, although not always, uh, capital formation is, is, is critically important. That's uh, usually endogenous in the model. Uh, productivity growth, 
Uh, there is some models treated as exogenous and uh, based productivity assumptions, sometimes at a very granular level across industries on historical data. Other models have endogenous uh, submodels that determine productivity growth as a rate of, uh, as an outcome of expenditure on R&D. Again, touching back on what Lars was talking about. In the short term, uh, these models can also have GDP growth uh, boosted or hindered by terms of trade effects or international models or by employment or unemployment uh, in the short run, which is unusual in, in GE models, but I will show you how it works in a minute. Uh, factor mobility is also important in thinking about GDP consequences. So factor mobility is jargon for saying that uh, in the models, uh, labor, for example, may or may not be able to migrate, and where migrate can mean between regions, but it can also mean between occupations and industries. If labor is not very mobile, if it's fixed in industries, occupations, and locations, then the consequences of policies can often have, they, they can often have very long-lasting costs because people can't move to new industries very easily. Physical capital can also be immobile. Usually it is pretty immobile. It can be specific to regions or specific to sectors. Uh, this is really important because it's very hard to uproot physical capital, uh, equipment, machinery, and so on from one industry and put it into another industry. Uh, except for a few things like IT, there's just huge losses in the value of the capital when you try to do that. So these are important things to think about when you're trying to model the short run impacts on GDP of policies. Okay, so I'm going to show you just to give you a concrete feel for how the model works, a simple application, an example application. This is from an EPA workshop on transitional labor dynamics held a few years ago. Uh, and the thing that I'm going to show you is what happens in G cubed when we simulate a decline in productivity in durable manufacturing. And so uh, what happens, what's going to happen in this simulation to illustrate several points is that I'm going to show you uh, what the results are from reducing the level of productivity in durable good produ production five years in the future. So agents are going to know in year zero that productivity is going to be the same through year five, and then it's going to go down by 1% and be permanently lower. The reason that this is of interest today is that this is both how regulations are often simulated in these models by saying, look, we're going to impose a uh, regulation on industry that's going to increase their cost, reduce their productivity. So you could think of this as anticipating a uh, direct regulation rather than a price regulation. But it could also be thinking about a future climate impact that's going to reduce productivity in the industry. Um, so, so I'm going to just skip over this mostly, but I'm going to just mention that most of what I said so far applies to general equilibrium models as a class. What I'm about to show you now really applies specifically to GQ because it has a bunch of features that are unusual for general equilibrium models. It was built initially uh, to try to glue together key features of macroeconomics with general equilibrium, and it has, it has a bunch of unusual features. So one of the features that it has, which is not universal in general equilibrium models, is that it has some agents who have foresight and some that do not. Uh, and there are a bunch of uh, reasons for that, but it uh, helps us do a better job of simulating the rate at which people adapt to actual policies in the world. Uh, it has sector-specific capital stocks, so it's hard to turn a coal plant into a solar uh, farm, for example, uh, which not all, believe it or not, not all models have that feature. Uh, it has a very detailed treatment of financial markets. So we treat, we track equity in each sector, government debt, international debt, foreign currencies, money supply, central bank policies, and the risk premium on all the assets, which has allowed us in other studies to examine questions like what happens if people suddenly become more anxious about the rate of return on household equity, right? So if you're worried about people's uh, homes uh, losing value because they are in flood prone, prone regions. Also, nominal wages adjust slowly, so th this model is not fully in equilibrium at all times. The labor market can be out of equilibrium in the short run, and it has full bilateral trade, which is very important for thinking about climate policy because the U.S. is not a small island economy. 
and climate is a global problem. So what goes on in, poli in the policy world in other countries uh, matters in the US. Um, okay, so what you see in this, uh, so this is a tiny slice of the results that you see after this study. So this is uh, showing you some, uh, in some outputs of the model in year seven of the simulation. So this is two years after the decline in productivity. So, uh, so there's just a snapshot in time. The graph that's on the left shows you the impact on output by the 20 industries in G-Cube. And the durable sector is affected the most because we reduced its productivity and made its price go up. People buy less of it. It harms the US uh, in terms of trade because durables are an important export. Uh, it also uh, reduces uh, demand by a bunch of things that are upstream and downstream of the durable market, including, for example, the services sector. The services sector doesn't see very much output decline, but the services sector is where most people in the US economy work. And so the thing on the right-hand side shows you what happens to employment. It's a little unusual, it's a waterfall graph. So, so the height of each individual bar shows the change in employment in that industry, but each bar is stacked at the end of the bar that was to its left. So you can read it as a cumulative reduction as you go across the page. So this particular shock uh, reduces employment in durables. It reduces employment in services. These are measured as uh, proportions of baseline employment. So the, the, the size of these things are similar numbers of people. So there are a lot of people who are, lose their jobs in the services sector, even though the services sector isn't affected very much, and it's because that's where most people work. And then the investment sector, which is where construction is in our model, is also hit by this as well that construct investment and because durable goods are part of the investment good. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to put this up here is that we are here to talk about macro, but a thing that I think we all have to always remember is that macro is not where the action is for climate, right? Where the action is, is with the individual sectors, it's with individual places. And so these, so these things are gonna average out to small impacts on GDP. But they're big impacts for people who work in the durables and services sector. Okay. Okay, this is what happens uh, if you look over time. The model is solved at an annual frequency. And so the thing on the left hand side shows the impact of this particular policy on total employment. So you can see that employment is not very much affected by anticipation of this shock. There's a little blip upward as people in the model produce a little extra durable goods just before the productivity in the sector goes down, right? This would be producing a little bit in anticipation of an onerous new regulation. Then, then employment goes down a lot for the reasons that we just talked about through year seven. And then it, then it returns uh, as the wage uh, adjusts. And by year 15, we're back to approximately full employment Although what's happened is that the mix of where people work has changed, right? People have moved from durables into services. So it's important to remember that even though there's no net employment change there, there've been a bunch of costs of people having, potential, having to change sectors, potentially having to change careers and maybe locations uh, in the economy, oh, geographic locations. Okay, what does this do to GDP and its components? Uh, the thing on the left shows uh, GDP, it, well, it shows, the thing on the left shows consumption, investment, and net exports. It doesn't show government spending, which is an important part of GDP, but here it's held constant uh, in construction of the simulation. Uh, so what you can see is that this particular policy causes investment to dip. That's the dash line because we just made investment goods a lot more expensive. Uh, consumption stays level ish, and then it eventually starts to dip. And the reason it starts to dip is because the decline in consumption reduces future capital stock, which reduces future income, and consumption has to fall as a result. Uh, also, this, this deteriorates US terms of trade, so it actually pushes net exports up uh, as a result of that. Um, okay, and then the impact on real GDP is shown on the right. Uh, there's a big overshooting. The overshooting in this model comes about because we allow for there to be unemployment. Without unemployment, you'd see a smooth trajectory going from up at the top over to the long-term uh, outcome on the right-hand side. All right. 
Okay, uh, I'm almost done here, but I want to uh, connect back to uh, something that's really important and also that came up. I mentioned uh, what came up, uh, Lars brought it up, and I mentioned that this is also my fear. It's really important to remember that these models are shot through with uncertainty, shot through with uncertainty, even when you try to build them really, really carefully using all the possible data and the best uh, techniques in econometrics. So these are, these are parameter estimates from another model, the iGEM model I mentioned earlier, which is a 35 sector model of the US. This is just part of the parameters in the model. There, it's a part that has to do with modeling household behavior, household consumption behavior. So there's a bunch of parameters over on the left, and you can see there's a value of parameter estimate, or there's a column for uh, parameter values minus 0.522, and then a standard error of 0 0.0028. All of your graduate students would be so excited, right? Like that, that's super significant, right? Well, it turns out, uh, it, well, it turns out, first of all, that's a, in this context, that's a dumb question to ask because this is the share of something that people buy in the budget and there's zero chance of it being non-positive. But the standard error is actually bigger than you think. So it's the tip of a, an iceberg of uh, the co covariance matrix between the parameters and the model, which is shown on the right. And what we uh, can do is we can take those covariance matrices and we can push them all the way through the model to calculate uh, the uncertainty in the model's results, to calculate standard errors for the results. And so these two graphs uh, are uh, diagrams from a study that we did looking at how uncertain the model's results are as a result of parameter uncertainty. And this is setting aside all kinds of other uncertainty, uncertainty about the exogenous variables, the residual uncertainty in the equations that because they don't fit very well in the specification Lars mentioned, climate uncertainty. This is just the parameters, the easy piece. The thing on the left shows you how much uncertainty there is in the long-term level of uh, output in different industries. And in case you can't read it, the bottom, these are percentages of the base case value. So the axis on the bottom says 40. That's 40%. That means the standard error just from the parameter estimates uh, in this model for our ability to predict the level of crude oil output in the United States is 40% of what we think that value is, right? If you imagine just drawing this as an error bar, that is huge. Most of it comes from uncertainty on the production side of the model. We did a decomposition into uh, how production and consumption uncertainty uh, manifests itself in different variables. The household uncertainties are uh, in green and the production uncertainties are in yellow, uh, orange. On the right-hand side are uncertainties in the macro variables. Uh, so consumption, the, our ability to predict the level of consumption, the standard error on that from just the parameter uncertainty is 4% of the baseline value. value. Our ability to predict uh, carbon emissions uh, is worse, right? The uh, uncertainty on that is uh, more than uh, about 13% of the level of output. So all these trajectories that we we're talking about for one trajectory, I understand administratively and politically why, why the answer has to be one trajectory, but the bands are big. The bands are big on these things. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is a little glimmer of hopeful light at the end of the tunnel. So the thing that we were really concerned about in this particular analysis was, do these uncertainties mean that we cannot say for sure whether climate policies actually help? And it turns out the answer to that is, I'm gonna have to phrase this carefully just to make sure it isn't misunderstood. The, the answer to that is, Despite having all of these uncertainties, when you track them all the way through the model, you can still say with authority that climate policy would work. So there's a particular climate uh, policy, it's carbon tax with a particular recycling assumption uh, run through the model. And so these are, these are policy derivatives. It's how much the level of the uh, variable changes uh, as a result of climate. And you can see the error bars on there. And so, so everyone here will probably be not surprised, but hopefully a little relieved to know that we can say with authority that climate policy is bad for the coal industry, right? There is no chance, the, 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 the error bar does not include zero. Coal is going down, okay? 
now I think as Jim pointed out, it already has, you know, but uh, it's good that the model can reproduce that. That's not true of all things. Agriculture, this could be bad news, a carbon tax or not bad news. It depends on how people substitute to or from agriculture as energy prices change. Um, on the carbon tax, on the macro side, we can say definitively that carbon will go down in spite of all these uncertainties and that the capital stock will actually go up. This was a capital stock recycling experiment. Okay, so I am now over time, but I am at the conclusion. And so this is just, I'll just go over this quickly. Uh, part of my brief was to talk about challenges and research needs. So for modeling transition policies, one of the difficulties is that we need a whole lot of energy sector detail, and it's difficult to get enough data on all of the uh, pieces that you need of the model to build in as much energy sector detail as we'd like. On modeling climate impacts, we need a high degree of geographic detail because that's where uh, climate impacts really show up. They affect different people in different locations. Uh, so we would ideally like to have a lot of geographic detail. Um, and so just to skip to the bottom, one of the conclusions that came out of this EPA SAB study is that it is going to be necessary to link models and to develop better protocols for doing that. So we know exactly what happens if we try to link a uh, highly geographically uh, detailed model of climate impacts to a more aggregate uh, general equilibrium or macro model of the US economy. And then finally, we need to not oversell this stuff. So these, I put this uh, percentages uh, of, um, baseline values up there just as a reality check. So when we're thinking about some of these changes that might occur to individual industries, it's important to think, are they gonna be in the noise or bigger than the noise, right? And how we can uh, do this modeling. So that is the end and I will stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Pete. So we're gonna open it up to questions. And while I load up your, the chat i'm gonna see um or no here sorry that's not what i want um let's see i think uh okay so one real quick question for you pete is on the on the uncertainties in in your parameters can you tell us a little bit about where you think those uncertainties come from and one of the things that I hear about, you know, kind of skepticism about projections from, from the CGE models is, you know, what we really don't know is what new technologies are going to emerge and what their costs are going to be and how and when they're going to penetrate at scale. And I'm just curious, like, how do you respond to those kinds of questions and over what time frame you think technology uncertainties become important? Okay, uh, thanks Adele. That's, uh, that's a great set of questions. Uh, I think uh, there are at least two questions there. And the first one is about the, where do the uncertainties come from that I mentioned? And so uh, those, those are just the, um, they just come from the covariance matrix in the parameters uh, in the model. So they don't have anything to do with technology. They just have to do with the fact that we have, um, you know, in the US, we have data since basically uh, World War II, which is not a super long data set. We have a lot of parameters that we want to estimate. And in some cases, we don't have a lot of variation in the prices uh, that uh, went in. Like for many years, energy prices were pretty stable in the United States. So we have limited variation, and we just don't have precise estimates of a lot of those parameters. And, and part of the reason we did this study and the reason I want to talk about today is that you might think, well, this is a whole bunch of imprecision in different sectors. Maybe it all averages out. And the answer is, no, we're not that lucky. It doesn't all average out, right? Some uncertainties matter a lot, depending on what you're looking at. And you can't get away from them by just hoping that they average out. Now, then the... the um, the second question you asked is about technology. And so in the models that I've worked on and uh, am most familiar with, uh, we put in productivity growth based on estimates from the historical record. So there's you know, a huge literature on people estimating productivity. Uh, careers have been devoted to that. And so we 
typically um, take estimates from the historical literature, people often say, well, this time is different. Uh, and so uh, if, if you think it might be different and that productivity growth is not really driven by a historical record, you can do scenario analysis and people often do that, uh, sensitivity analysis and look at what happens. Um, so. Thanks. Did you want me to say something or not? Yeah, if you want to address the, the, the question, sure. I, I can talk, talk very briefly about the technology side of things. So for us, it's a very, very specific type of technological advance we're looking at, and that's a development of a new green technology that dramatically changes the uh, whole production technology. And so for us, it's, it's a rather abrupt discovery with lots of R&D going into it. Uh, there's other ways to, to have modeled it, and, and uh, which would be much more smoother trajectories, and, and, and those would, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a place where we had a we're looking forward to doing further work, but we have to input into that things like you know this, these probabilistic specifications about the success of the technology, and then we introduce the possibility that that's misspecified and see what the consequences of that are. Great. Okay, so I'm going to start on the, I think Heather and then Galena. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so thank you. What a great um, set of presentations. Thank you so much. So I have two questions um, and I think they're both for Pete, but I'd love to hear you both on them. Um, so Pete, you made, a, you made a, a, a comment near the end that the action in the transition is really about sectors, places, jobs. And I think one of the things that I am, you know, we struggle with in this in all of this work is that because our tools are designed for a different kind of macroeconomic environment, you know, a, a different set of macroeconomic questions, um, we're, we're not able to use them to actually unpack what policymakers really, I think, need to know to do both fiscal and monetary policy, right? If you have um, inflation that's caused by supply chain challenges due to a clean energy transition, that might, you might act in a different way than if it's caused by something else, for example. <laughs> Um, and so I just wanted to hear, like, how do we think about that? Um, I mean, I'm coming at this from the policy perspective, but I'm curious as, a, as modelers, how you think about that question and how we could do better to un, unpack that more. Are there ways to, to show that better? So I just, I wanted you to say a little bit more about that. And then um, my second question is one of the things that we've struggled with uh, in the Biden administration is that the policies that we're doing aren't what modelers model. Um, and so when you say that um, that it could be that this policy is effective, I'm like, well, yeah, but we're not actually doing a carbon tax. So um, I'm just curious uh, how you all are thinking about incorporating the, the much more complicated set of policies. And it's not just that there's more of them, um, and they're more complicated, but they are being done in concert. Um, and I think that is something that we have been really thinking about. And I'm curious on your thoughts on that as well, that it's not just one policy, but we are doing these suites of policies sector by sector. Um, so those are my two big questions. Thank you. Thank you. So um, so I'll, I'll try to tackle them in reverse order. So, uh, so the, the, the very fine grained nature of the regulations and policies are the reason at the end I concluded by saying that that uh, there's always going to be an important need for more sectoral detail and more technological detail in the model because that's what you need to have the hooks for the policy uh, to fit in. Um, so, uh, so more detail is always useful in the short term, though, if you're working with a model which doesn't have as much detail as you want. Uh, people have lots of uh, back, so so it, typically what people have done in the past for energy sector policies like that is to work with uh, energy uh, engineers, engineering uh, studies from the energy sector uh, to look at what would happen to um, energy technologies under some policy, like how fast new technologies would be adopted. And then we can map those into inputs that could be used in a reasonably detailed CGE model. Um, I must want to give a shout out to the uh, EPA folks uh, who are behind the SAGE model because EPA has a, a very um, a, a very nicely done general equilibrium model, which is now for the first time being used 
uh, for regulation, uh, regulatory purposes, air regulation, which is, um, in, and they've had to grapple with a lot of those issues in building mock. So uh, you never have as much detail as you'd like, but there are ways to approximate it. The, the first question I think of as, as, a, as a reason, I guess, why I feel relieved to be an academic and to not be one of the people on the hot seat who have to respond to the executive order. So, so the executive <laughs> order says we want to know what the risks of climate change are for the macro economy. And really, if we go out in the hall, we'll all say, well, the risks are to the micro economy, right? It's the people who live on the coast or near a lake or who own property that's now going to be dry. And and the and actually from a career in working in general equilibrium model, I can tell you if you don't already know this, that a lot of that stuff will average out. There are going to be the reason I put up the thing about the changes in employment is that there are winners and losers from all these policies, right? There are going to be people who lose their jobs and other people who get jobs because of this. The net impact is going to be small, but the micro impact is big. And so Going forward, I think we just need to always be sure, wherever possible, to communicate that the macro average is not the micro level of detail. Yeah, if I could respond uh, to the last point, I think um, it's often the case that the macro impacts are smaller than the micro impacts. But in the case of climate change, I don't, I, I don't even know that we know that the macro impacts are going to be small. I think down the road they could actually be quite substantial. But but I absolutely agree that uh, that, that 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 the way to go is to look at more kind of um, heterogeneous effect across regions, locations, countries, and the, and the like. Um, on on the other the part, parts of the question, um, in terms of monetary versus fiscal policy, I've I've written for the journal Monetary Economics a somewhat skeptical essay on the potency of monetary policy to address climate change and 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 what and and, and the limits limitations to what central bank policy is. I think really the important challenges are more on the fiscal side. Um, Financial stability is a non-trivial issue potentially, uh, but that's going to play out over a much longer time period. And in truth, the financial stability concerns right now that firms face are based on policy uncertainty. So it's like you're asking the monetary policy authority to address uncertainty that comes from other sources, which is an interesting, it's an interesting game in its own in, in its own way. Um, but the other thing which, which I wanted to emphasize, and I should emphasize this in my talk, that the first thing that we're doing relative to most uncertainty quantifications is we're putting it inside the policy problem instead of outside. Lots of studies kind of do it outside and we're put, put it inside. Now, the point I should have emphasized, and I'm glad you raised this question, is put, uh, when we're solving our most prudent policy, that is only a baseline against which we compare ad hoc policies. And so, so we have to take the next step to say, what's, you know, suppose you start imposing ad hoc policies, how close are they getting us to, to do something that's prudent and, and, um, and kind of where are the big gaps? And so what's missing in my, in my calculations here was the assessment of the ad hoc policies, which is absolutely vital for this research program to be successful and stuff that we have to work on. And this, uh, this also, uh, um, you know, yeah, very important as we're studying the Brazilian Amazon too. We, we can figure out what the prudent policy is there, but there's lots of potentially ad hoc solutions that might get you at least part of the way there. And, and, and so then we can at least try to measure how you know, kind of what's left over. But anyway, thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Lars reminded me that I missed part of Heather's uh, question. So the, the just one tiny thing to add to that is that one thing that comes out of our work is that the... Um, the different pieces of the government need to talk to one another because a lot of climate policy is about making things more expensive. It's explicitly about raising the cost of energy in places. And so, it, so if the Federal Reserve doesn't handle it properly, that could be mistaken for regular price inflation, right? When really it's a designed in relative price change in the economy, right? So, so if the Fed mistakes it for inflation when you're doing this, then the reaction would be to slow the money, money supply growth and possibly create a recession at the time when you're trying to implement the carbon tax. So coordination is important. I think we have a paper on that, don't we, Pete? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move to the other questioners. I'm going to just ask folks to, so we can get enough uh, questions in um, to keep your questions kind of succinct. Uh, so we can we can take let's take let's take uh, Galena and Fakri together. Okay, uh, you know you go first. Yeah, thanks. I have a question for Pete. I guess um, it's a little bit really two questions about agricultural sector. So we 
you know, in majority of macro models, we don't have it, but for climate, I think it's the most vulnerable sector to climate risk. So we really need to worry about that. And one question I have is for the US, how important it is in terms of the impact on crop yields, uh, how that translates into the inflation and uh, therefore consumption. And so just quantitatively, is that important enough for the US? And in that same context, how much of an adjustment are you allowing in the model for crop switching, for example, because maybe crop yields go down to zero, so I've got to grow something else. I can't grow rice in California anymore. And another question is about the emissions from the agricultural sector, right? Especially if the policies we're considering are CO2 specific, the share of agriculture emissions will start going up if we're reducing CO2 from the energy sector. And potentially the adaptation of agricultural sector to the physical risks can also be affecting those emissions. So is that something that your model can incorporate at this stage? Or not? Yeah, so again, to- Wait. Oh. I'm sorry, Galena, do you mind introducing yourself? I should have. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Galena Hale, UC Santa Cruz. Okay, great. Okay, and Fakri, let's take your question as well and, and please introduce yourself. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I'm Fakri Hasanov, I, I'm from King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center located in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So um, my question is related to Peter's presentation, uh, specifically speaking, uh, related to G cube model. So, so one of the one of the slides showed that uh, in, in, in the model uh, we have labor sector uh, has this equilibrium represented by unemployment. Uh, however, the other sectors, let, let's say real sector, fiscal sector, monetary, and et cetera, they, they are all in equilibrium. So I'm trying to understand, I, I much appreciate if you, if you can help me to understand. So if one sector it can have this equilibrium and the other sec while other sectors are in, in equilibrium, then this equilibrium from the labor sector again, represented by unemployment, how can be accounted for other sectors? Because they have implication for other sectors. For example, if you have high employment, then government spending or fiscal spending can go up or, or, or real sector can go down due to unemployment in, in, in certain sectors. So how can this disequilibrium uh, emerging from the labor market can be uh, properly accounted in the other sectors, but they are in equilibrium setup. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So, so um, on the agriculture uh, pair of questions, um, I, I and my colleagues haven't done work on looking at the impacts of climate on agriculture at the level of detail you asked about, but um, if we were going to do something like that, I think we would reach out to uh, one of the agriculture models to see what they have done, like FASM, and see what impacts they expect to happen. And then we would translate those into productivity shocks to feed them into the model and see what happens to the rest of the economy. In terms of emissions, uh, these models, uh, our models, but also many other CGE models, have had uh, emissions coefficients attached to all of the inputs and outputs from all of the sectors. So they are able to track emissions of CO2 from agriculture, but also emissions of nitrous oxide and, um, and the whole gamut of pollution, both emissions in process and emissions from combustion. Uh, and in terms of uh, switching uh, gears to uh, the labor market, uh, what happens in our model is, is basically pretty straightforward, even though, uh, Everyone, there are people who are who would like to work but can't at the current wage. We track everyone's income and expending and spending throughout the economy, and we look for the equilibrium set of prices that make supply and demand balance in all the other markets, uh, given those sets of income. So, so what we get is an equilibrium in say the durable goods market that is not the same as the one that we would have if there were no unemployment, but we do get one where all of the accounting holes 
Uh, everyone's expenditure is someone else's income. No one gets any income that doesn't come from someone else's expenditure. Uh, and we end up with a, with basically an equilibrium that's conditional on some of the people not being working. Great, Th thanks, Pete. Um, Lori and then Bob. <laughs> I was stuck, I wasn't allowed to unmute, but thanks for the authority to unmute. So hi everybody, I'm Lori Hunter. I'm a sociologist and demographer from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and related to that, I had a question for Pete, especially the, the microeconomy model. You mentioned human migration a couple of times, um, the spatial, spatial kind of human migration. I was curious how that shows up in the model. Um, uh, you know, what any sort of movement in that realm is based on and does climate, is climate able to impact any of it as yet in the model? So, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, let's go ahead and take um, Bob as well. Hey, uh, so I think this is going to be your question to wrap up on probably, but um, you guys highlighted several things that were not in the models we heard about this morning, sectoral detail, geographic detail, uncertainty, and a set of questions for which you need those to answer. Um, where, what do you think can be done with the existing models? And where is the answer simply that the models being used are not up for the questions being asked of them? Um, that is definitely a question to end on, but uh, to go back to Lori's question, um, uh, that, that's an excellent question. The models that I know of are have not uh, yet been used to model uh, regional migration due to climate change as an endogenous process. Um, it could be done uh, if with with uh, it, it could be added into a model, but right now most models uh, treat population as as uh, immobile between regions um, and. That's true, even if there is climate change. Um, in terms of uh, um, moving forward, I think I think the white paper actually lays out a pretty good plan for how to um, move forward on some of these questions. Um, it uh, it I think it is not an easy thing to do in. In some sense, GDP is just not the right thing for measuring this problem, right? An earlier question came up. We talked a lot about infrastructure and whether spending to raise highways is wasteful. And, and actually, it isn't wasteful at all. It's just not very well included in GDP, right? The reason it isn't included in GDP is we spend money building a highway and we don't charge anyone anything to use the highway. We give it away, right? So none of the benefits of highways ever appear in GDP, but not because they're not there. It's because the accounting doesn't include them. Uh, they appear indirectly in productivity growth. So they're, they're, and then environmental benefits don't appear in GDP in, investment, is maybe not what you want if you're trying to measure welfare and GDP. So it's so moving moving toward more detailed models and moving toward a more detailed representation of the consequences of policies than just looking at GDP growth is important, but it's going to be a big lift. Bridget, do we need to stop there? Could we have just like a yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, first, I want to make an amendment about the spatial models. Uh, my, um, my colleague Esteban Rossi and various co-authors have been doing the models in which you endogenously move people around the world in order to address climate change. I worry that their cost structure isn't quite right. And, you know, the idea is we're going to we can always move people to uh, Canada or Siberia in order to, 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 to address uh, uh, climate change. What's nice about those models is the endogenous responses and whether we got the, whether we got the migration cost right yet, yeah, I think it really you know, remains a very open issue. The same thing shows up in our models of the Brazilian Amazon, in which we're reallocating production activities over time uh, and, and in, into different locations in ways that are uh, socially prudent. And so there's a, a very important spatial component to those too. So I think there's lots of interest in this kind of spatial part of it, but it's, it's um, I think there's much more important work to be done. Um, let's see. 
Robert's, I'm not trying to remember your question. It was about um, macro models. Basically, what you, you, you guys identified and your focus was on, on uncertainty, several things that were really not yeah. present in the models this morning. So right. how far can we push those models and where do we need yeah. to tell, tell yeah. our folks that? So let me that give, give, give kind of two responses to that. I think this idea about thinking about uncertainty in broader terms, uh, you know, all the way from misspecification, ambiguity can 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 help frame uncertainty discussions more generally across a variety of set of models, and that's not really confined to our setup here. Um, now, 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 the thing, the, the challenge we're facing is to is is to put a lot of richness, both um, geographical and elsewhere. We're facing computational challenges in, in order to go forward and in, in order to integrate the full range of uncertainties that we want. So, so I don't want to claim that's a fully trivial thing to do. We, you know, we're having to use you know, various machine learning method you know, in order to expand state variables. We're doing a variety of other to, to try to find computational tricks to make the, um, uh, the models much more um, richer along the you know, sp spatial dimension multiple sectors, multiple locations and the like. So I think there's much important work to be done there and, and, and we're uh, anxious to pursue it. Thanks. Okay, so we're gonna have just like a lightning round. Uh, George, Jim and Steve, just kind of keep your question to like, no, okay, all right. Maybe you can, one more question. Okay, all right. All right, George, George, you're it. Hi, I'm George Kovartov. I'm an economist at the OCC. I was um, wondering about kind of your thoughts on the uh, materiality and availability of tools on the interaction between macroeconomic midterm scenarios and the climate scenarios. So this is coming from a financial stability perspective. And I could imagine like, you know, there's, we have stress testing, which is like a business cycle shock, and we have our climate scenarios. And, and, and you know, I think people are interested about the interaction of them in both ways. It could be that climate scenarios, uh, you know, the physical hazards or transitions could cause increased vulnerability in some sort of nonlinear way. Um, and, then, and then on the other side, you know, a, a business cycle shock could cause like a delayed transition. So, so are the existing tools kind of up to the task? Are there um, additional kind of avenues forward? Just curious to hear your thoughts. Um, so I've written rather skeptically on the uh, on the use of um, stress test with 30 year climate scenarios that the central banks have been doing. First of all, I'm not sure the answers to the, to the questions they ask make a whole lot of sense. If, if you, if you allow an, a firm to tell you um, under this climate trajectory for 30 years, here's what I would do, then I can address that problem. But that's not that's not the real problem they address. They face fundamentally uncertainty, and that's going to unfold over a very long long time period. That's very different than the financial crisis about you know suppose something's going to happen tomorrow. Are you prepared for that? Um, so I really don't see how I, the, the scenario stuff, it seems to me, has to be pushed into realms under which we put some type of probability bounds on things or plausibility across the scenarios or it's just not going to work very well. And um, one, one of my concerns about scenarios as we go kind of put multiple inputs into it is there's ought to be interdependence in those probabilities and how we put those to, uh, you know, on the table becomes quite becomes quite important. Like imagine that we have uncertainty about emissions, but we also have uncertainty about damages. As we start damaging the um, the, uh, the environment more and more, there's going to be an endogenous policy response that's going to start connecting those things. And so, so um, so even there, you have to start thinking about the codependencies of these things that that in, in ways that are that that can be somewhat challenging. Um, so I, I I think there's some interesting stuff to be done there, but it requires a lot more thought. Thanks for the question. So please I'll join just, me in. Oh, I'll just if, add a little bit that if you if if you had to go forward with doing this now with existing models, I think there's a lot that can be done, but I think the key for understanding financial stability in particular is understanding asset holdings and having data on who owns what. Because for financial stability, the key question is, are, are the losses going to be concentrated in, in organizations or sectors uh, which which might then be subject to margin calls or something like that, and then uh, fail when if the if everyone was diversified, there wouldn't be a problem. So, so, so I, I so the Fed I think has this data. Whether whether other people can get access to it to understand 
who holds what is less clear to me, but I think it can be done. Great. Please join me in thanking our pa terrific panelists. And we'll now open uh, the Slido tab again for this session for folks to kind of discuss and add their ideas, additional questions or feedback on, on the session's topic. Um, so again, we encourage people to discuss amongst themselves and I think we'll open the breakout rooms for our virtual participants, um, but then we'll be breaking until 3.15 um, when we'll move into our last panel.